All right, so I'm excited to introduce everybody to Cynthia Thurlow, a friend of mine, a colleague, and a well-respected author. I'm gonna introduce her quick, go through a little of her history, and we're gonna dive into her um, new book that's coming out on intermittent fasting, the intermittent fasting transformation. You see it in the background back there. It's a great book. I've actually already read through it. It was a great read, actually. Um, I, I read many books and there's a lot of them that I read that I'm like, eh, it's okay. This actually has a lot of great information. It's I actually learned some things. I'm gonna ask you some questions, actually some things I actually didn't know. So you can help explain that to the audience as well. So a little bit about Cynthia. Cynthia is a nurse practitioner, CEO and founder of Everyday Wellness Project and an international speaker with over 10 million views for a second TEDx talk, Intermittent Fasting Transformational Technique. With over 20 years of experience in health and wellness, Cynthia is a globally recognized expert in intermittent fasting, nutritional health, and has been featured on ABC, Fox 5, KTLA, CW, Medium, Entrepreneur, and the Meg Megyn Kelly Show. She was listed in Yahoo Finance as one of the 21 founders changing the way we do business. Cynthia hosts the Everyday Wellness um, Podcast, which actually is one of the 25 podcasts to expand your mind in 2021 by Business Insider. Her mission is to educate women on the benefits of intermittent fasting, overall holistic health and wellness, so they feel empowered to live their optimal lives. Cynthia, welcome. I'm really super excited to have you here today. Thank you. I've been really looking forward to our conversation. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, my audience may not be familiar with you, some of your background, you know, your time at Hopkins, et cetera, like your own health experience and what kind of got you to where you're at? Great question. I'm a traditional allopathic trained nurse practitioner. I did all of my training in Baltimore and I'm a bit of an adrenaline junkie. I actually was an ER nurse uh, before becoming a nurse practitioner and I did 16 years in cardiology. So as you can well imagine, uh, being an adrenaline junkie, those are really great places to be in terms of the complexity of patients and dealing with acute and urgent emergencies. And over time, you know, after becoming a parent, um, I started to shift my focus quite a bit, largely because I had a child with life-threatening food allergies. And the words that I was left with by a colleague uh, after we determined that he had life-threatening food allergies was carry an EpiPen and pray. And as anyone who's a parent can imagine that that was not satisfactory to me, that I was not willing to let that be his destiny. And I really started to look much more comprehensively at the influence of food and health. Um, we've all, we had always been healthy eaters, but started to, to kind of delve a little bit deeper into some of the things that influence the quality of, of the food that we consume at home or get in a grocery store or from our farmer's market. And so I always credit Jack, who's now going to be 17 this year, that it really changed my whole outlook on health and wellness. And so initially I started a PhD program, which I hated, uh, and then I started a wellness coaching program. And then I read two books. I read a book called The Unhealthy Truth by Robin O'Brien, which if you have not read it, is a book that really changed the trajectory of my career. And uh, I think so highly of her work. And then I read another book called Eat the Oaks. And I reached out to that author and said, where did you get your nutrition training? Because I think this is really the area I'm most in interested in learning more about. And so I did a functional nutrition program and that really changed everything. I really struggled to, you know, continue working uh, in the hospital and, and clinic because I was really constrained by a, a different medical model than I wanted to focus on. So in 2016, I left clinical medicine and started my own business and almost instantaneously started attracting a particular type of patient, um, a woman that was very much like I was, you know, middle-aged, never had had any problems with weight gain and, and weight loss resistance. And you know, probably in my early 40s, I was completely unaware of the impact of perimenopause. And honest to God, I don't think anyone had ever used that term. It was all new to me. And I was, I was completely um, frustrated with the, the options that my conventional GYN had offered me, which included things like synthetic hormones and IUD and ablation or a hysterectomy. And I said, there has to be a better way. And so through my own challenges um, and through my own trajectory of my own health journey, I came to intermittent fasting out of curiosity, which is, you know, I love learning. And I read Jason Fung's book, um, The Complete Guide to Fasting, and that gave me the courage. I always say courage because I think that's the right word to use that as a traditionally trained nurse practitioner that I could not only embrace that concept, there was really good research and I could then utilize that as a strategy with my female patients. And so that's really how I came to intermittent fasting. And I felt so much better nearly instantaneously and then it started to bleed into the work that I was doing with women 
Um, and then it, you know, kind of evolved into programs and one-on-one -on -one, um, group programs and, and things like that. And so I, I feel that intermittent fasting in a lot of ways opened up a whole other, whole other ways and opportunities to look at aging and not just look at it through the lens of this is just the way things are. Cause I, I'm sure very much like you are, um, I don't like being told there are no solutions to a problem. I like to find solutions and I like to share the information that I learned so that other women and men um, can benefit enormously. So that's how I've kind of gotten to where I am today. What I'm most well known for at this point is a series of talks that I did in 2018 and 2019, uh, one of which, as you mentioned, went viral. And then that kind of solidified that intermittent fasting was a strategy that I needed to be talking about and people needed to learn more about. Well, I think intermittent fasting is also interesting because I was finished reading a book by this um, um, Austrian doctor, FX Mayer, if you ever heard of his name, and 1950s, talking about intermittent fasting and how different fasting thing was helping his patients. And even Dr. Volek's work, mm -hmm. which he's like one of the big researchers in fasting, his research goes back 40 years mm -hmm. um, using fasting for type one diabetics, for cancer, for a whole lots of things. So I think, you know, this is, it's really popular right now. It's been popularized in the, in the news media, but this is actually deep science. When I go to my, my, um, do my peptide therapy stuff. I do my peptide training. And I realize a lot of things we're doing now are literally just replicating what fasting does naturally. Yep. So it's just a, such a powerful tool. Um, so a couple of questions, you know, your, your book, intermittent fasting, you're a female hormone expert, you know, when people say hormones, you know, I think there's some confusion, what that word means. Is it just estrogen? Is it just testosterone, progesterone? Can you walk us through all the different hormones and how they kind of interact with each other? Maybe not all of them, but, like, <laughs> but, like the, but maybe the triad and kind of like the hierarchy, mm -hmm. how, you know, adrenal, pancreas, thyroid, all this plays. And it's not just about estrogen and progesterone. Well, and I think there's a lot of misinformation. I think people think of like one hormone just has one effect. And I remind people that there's this beautiful orchestration in the body that hormones really are chemical messengers and they can be turned on or turned off for a variety of reasons. They're ultimately under control by the endocrine system and the hypothalamus pituitary axis. So in our brain, we have you know, a specific part of our brain that uh, controls the release of specific types of hormones. Um, there are lots of hormones that act as exocrine or endocrine organs. So they may act um, solely on their own. They may need to be activated. I, I always like to use the example of thyroid hormone because I think the thyroid is so poorly understood uh, by most, if not all of us. And that you know, we have thyroid receptors on nearly every cell in the, every cell in the body. And so understanding that there's never any impact on a hormone that doesn't have a downward effect, meaning if you impact cortisol, you're ultimately going to impact insulin, you're going to end and ultimately impact thyroid hormone and sex hormones. And so let's really talk about the hierarchy as you referred to. And oxytocin is a hormone that is not does not get enough respect. It's one that not a lot of people talk about. Ironically, I, I ran a webinar last night and one of the participants that was speaking with me, a female physician said, oxytocin gets no respect, but yet it's one of the most critically important hormones. And so oxytocin is released in response to, um, you know, hugging, cuddling, when a, when a mom is breastfeeding her baby, when you have an orgasm with your partner or by yourself, um, you know, just doing things that bring you joy. And so I, I remind people that oxytocin doesn't hang around for a long time. So you want to get oxytocin hits, if you will, throughout the day. And that's why connecting to others is really important. You know, we're not as humans designed to live by ourselves forever. So oxytocin has a huge impact on cortisol. Cortisol is one of these hormones that really gets a bad rap in many, many ways that people think cortisol is bad, insulin is bad. And I remind people when they're properly balanced, they're actually beautiful hormones. The issue is in our over harried hedonistic environment that we're living in, cortisol is tapped into all the time. It is designed to be an emergency backup system. You know, we're being chased by a rabid dog. Cortisol is our friend. It is, you know, shunting blood to extremities so that we can run. It is making our vision really clear. It shuts down digestion. Um, you know, it, it allows us to flee from danger, but cortisol in our current world is constantly tapped into. So we have a very sympathetic dominant, you know, we have the autonomic nervous system, sympathetic dominance and, and parasympathetic, and we want to find balance, but most people are constantly stressed, whether it's you argued with your spouse, you got stuck in traffic, um, you're stressed about a bill, you're just having a bad day, that's tapping into cortisol. And over time, 
if cortisol is not properly balanced and oxytocin, when we are taking the time to connect with others and connect with our children or our dogs or our significant other or spouse, we are releasing oxytocin, which can help buffer cortisol. And, you know, the other like kind of big hormone is insulin and insulin is thought of as a bad hormone because we hear about insulin resistance. We hear about diabetes or about metabolic inflexibility. And I remind people when insulin is properly balanced, all is well in the body. It is really an, an important hormone to understand how it works. Yes. When we eat, when our blood sugar goes up, insulin is secreted to bring down our blood sugar. But over time, if we're eating the wrong foods, if we're chronically stressed, we're not getting enough sleep, we're physically inactive, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, we get into a, a, a situation where we are going to have chronically elevated insulin. And, and the important tie-in with fasting and insulin is the understanding that when our insulin levels are low, when we're in an unfed state, it generally allows our body to tap into fat stores for energy. It's important for people to understand that if our insulin levels are up, guess what? You are not burning any fat and you are in fat storage mode. And it's important for people to understand that the way to, one of the ways to master um, balancing insulin is to eat less frequently. So insulin, cortisol, and oxytocin are really important. And from there, there's downward impact on the gut microbiome, immune function, our sex hormones, an important tie-in to being chronically stressed is that, you know, your body differentiates priorities and obviously fleeing from danger is not going to set you up to have a libido or have sex or anything like that. So I remind people that in the hierarchy of hormones, if you're chronically stressed, you are going to get up regulation of cortisol initially, you'll get down regulation of DHEA, which will impact testosterone, which will impact libido, which will impact potentially even the conversion of testosterone to estrogen. And so it's not any surprise when people are chronically habitually stressed that they have zero libido. It also has a downward effect on progesterone as well, but just for oversimplification, it's also important to kind of tie in another bigger hormone like thyroid hormone, um, which we have a whole series of middle-aged men and women that are dealing with underactive thyroids, which I think a lot of it's environmental and stress mediated. Uh, we know the number one reason why people will develop Hashimoto's is because of an autoimmune condition. Most people with an underactive thyroid actually have Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Um, and, and certainly for women, this is the number one reason. I think if, if I remember the last statistic, it was somewhere between 80 to 85% may even be higher depending on who you're, which research you're looking at. And it's not at all uncommon if we look at the three-legged stool, which is when I talk about your adrenals, you know, the cortisol, DHEA, and then talking about thyroid hormone and your sex hormones, that if one is imbalanced, they're all imbalanced. And so it's important to understand that all of our lifestyle choices, whether it's how frequently we eat, how much our, how, how high quality our sleep is, our anti-inflammatory nutrition choices, the type of, of exercise that we do, our connection to a higher purpose. And for every one of us that might be very different has a tremendous net impact on regulation of appetite cravings, um, balancing of these hormones. I didn't even touch on leptin and ghrelin, but those are our kind of key differentiated uh, appetite control hormones. And those get dysregulated when cortisol, uh, insulin, et cetera, are not properly balanced. So it's important for everyone to understand that all the hormones communicate with one another. They are all interrelated. There's no way to have one that's off balance, that it doesn't have a downward effect on others. And I think once we understand that, that it's this tremendous orchestration between all of these hormones that allow our bodies to be in a, a state of homeostasis or not. Uh, I think that's a really key understanding to, you know, probably finding value. I, I think that I, my, my running kind of joke is I never had a healthy amount of respect for the endocrine system until now, like certainly not until I was a middle-aged person, because up until that point, you don't think about your hormones, or at least I wasn't thinking about them as, as uh, intricately as I do now. And I think, you know, take home point is it's really complicated, it's interconnected. You know, one of the issues I kind of run into is people think I'm, I just need more estrogen. I just need more thyroid. It's just my adrenals. And I, you know, I, yeah, what I love what you're saying is that you're saying it's more than just mm -hmm. women's ovaries. It's more than just your thyroid. It's actually this interconnectivity because our bodies are amazingly designed and made for this balance. And so I routinely will see people come in my clinic who are like on high levels of progesterone orally and makes your cortisol go up. And so high progesterone can make you look really super anxious. And so same thing with thyroid, dosing thyroid to symptoms, which I didn't realize was a thing, but evidently it's a thing, you know, 
and like looking at everything and having that expertise, I feel like is huge and it's often overlooked. Um, so really th thanks for like touching those together. That was really insightful. And I just think it, it speaks to how interconnected all these things are. Um, I want to um, quote your book back to you. We talked about this before, because <laughs> um, that's one of the reasons we're here. Um, your book was really interesting and it had some really interesting insights. So um, one of the quotes I came across um, in regards to intermittent fasting, I began to incorporate intermittent fasting into my life. I was amazed by what happened. Over time, I started to sleep soundly through the night. You resulted in balanced melatonin, insulin, estrogen, serotonin, not only through intermittent fasting, but also through the changes you made to nutrition, to my exercise program, and to the way I was handling stress. It all works together in a rather wonderful fashion to balance hormones and then promoting sleep quality. The thing I heard there multiple times was sleep. Tie hormones and sleep and fasting together for us a little bit, if you would. Yeah, sleep is foundational to our health. It is It is not, I, I will sleep when I'm dead. I have a, a family member who had a very, very demanding job throughout her lifetime. She lost 30 pounds when she retired because she was finally not, she was finally actually sleeping well and had less stress. So foundational to our health, really, it is, it is without question, one of the most important investments you can make in your health is to make sure you're getting high quality sleep. And I recognize there are people that are probably watching this. They're saying, I don't need more than six hours a night of sleep. Well, if you really look at the sleep research, yes, there are variants of people that have genetic susceptibilities or genetic kind of genetic epigenetic changes that allow them to get away with six and a half hours worth of sleep. But I remind most people that high quality sleep and high quality sleeps means sufficient amount of REM, deep sleep, it's restorative. It is so, so important. And I, I think I, the best example I can give um, that would be relevant to a lot of people is that when I became a parent and I was breastfeeding each one of my kids and, and it was like, I was up every two hours for months um, and I was completely exhausted. Well, when you don't get a proper amount of sleep, you have appetite cues that are missed you're not going to crave broccoli. You are going to make probably food choices for something that is going to be quick uh, and is going to raise your blood sugar, make you feel better. So I craved cookies and brownies and cake. And these are not normally things I eat, but my body was craving things that, that made it feel good, whether it was releasing serotonin, dopamine, et cetera. But when people are not sleeping properly, I remind that we know statistically that if you get less than six hours a night of sleep, you are going to have less well-controlled blood sugar. You are going to impact dysregulation of other hormones, cortisol. Uh, you are not going to get those leptin and ghrelin cues uh, for satiety or fullness. Uh, we know that it, it is very, very important that we're secreting sufficient amount of melatonin at night. Uh, what a lot of people don't understand, there's this whole glymphatic system that goes on. It requires so much uh, brain power that it, you know, we can only do this when we're asleep. You miss opportunities to do this waste and recycling process, much like autophagy when we're not eating, really important there. Uh, melatonin is not just a sleep hormone, it is a master antioxidant. The more I understand about melatonin, the more humbled I am by this hormone. There's so much to learn about it, but it's not only that, it also impacts our menstrual cycles. It impacts um, you know, our ability to uh, interact, you know, it impacts memory, it impacts cognition. I mean, there's so many downward effects in negative ways when we are not getting sufficient amount of sleep and it tells our bodies that we are there, there's too much. It's like this, this degree of hormetic stress, you know, stress in the right amount at the right time. Um, too little sleep is telling our bodies, like we need to kind of clamp down, like it can impact in for, it can impact fertility. It can impact our menstrual cycle. And so from my perspective, sleep is always foundational. It's the first thing I work on with all women and certainly if I were working with men, I would be doing the same thing. We have to dial in on sleep because once I can get someone to sleep through the night, everything else will fall into place beautifully. And, and it's that important that I will say to people, if I can't get you to sleep through the night, I can't get you to lose weight. If I can't get you to sleep through the night, I don't want you to add an intermittent fasting. That's really how critically important it is. But certainly not during my training was this emphasized enough because as you, as all of us that are in the medical community, uh, when you go through your training, there's this accepted realization that we're meant to be sleep deprived. We'll sleep when we're older. Um, and, and I would be the first person to say that the way that I'm able to show up in the world every day and to do it with you know high integrity uh, is to make sure that I'm getting enough sleep. So for everyone that's watching, sleep is foundational. If you're not sleeping well, figure out why. And then you can start laying in these other types of beneficial stressors that can 
you know, allow you to age with additional grace and, and tap into some of those wellness benefits. I mean, I, I said the exact same thing during my medical training. I'll sleep when I'm dead. Yep. When you're working 36, my longest shift was a 42 hour shift and you don't sleep for 42 hours straight. You know, it's not, you know, they don't do that anymore, but it's just, no. you know, you, you kind of have almost have to say you'll sleep when you're dead. Um, and melatonin, you're so right. Melatonin is a master antioxidant. It, it balances cortisol. You know, if your melatonin is not recharging, guess what? Your cortisol is never going to reset as well, you know? Yeah. And so it's really, really super huge. Um, so hormones and perimenopause, that's something you actually talk about. And I want to get to your phases A through E, which <laughs> I learned some things about to this. That was kind mm -hmm. of intriguing to me, you know? Um, let's talk specifically about estrogen. I, you know, you just mentioned that estrogen can go up 30% during the first um, part of perimenopause, which I think a lot of people don't know mm -hmm. that your estrogen, as the progesterone is going down, estrogen actually is going up. Can you talk to us a little bit of like, what kind of things women will experience during this phase, leading this, when this, you're getting this imbalance that happens typically, I'm not gonna say naturally, cause there's a lot of other things going there, but when the estrogen is going up and the progesterone is going down. Yeah, I think that's really important for women to understand the changes that are going to happen because if you know what's coming, you can anticipate it as opposed to me flying into the wall of perimenopause. So number one, our ovaries are producing less progesterone. So you get this relative estrogen dominant state and this can manifest in, so with lowered progesterone levels, anxiety, depression, sleep disturbances, and what are women typically offered? Antidepressants, anti-anxiety agents, sleeping aids, uh, when in essence, they actually probably need a little bit of progesterone. When estrogen is in this dominant state, you can deal with weight gain. You may have very heavy periods. Um, this is when my GYN uh, so nicely offered me the, the four options of synthetic hormones and IUD and ablation or a hysterectomy, which I was completely taken aback by. But generally what you're dealing with is um, tender breasts, weight gain. Um, you may have specific types of food cravings. Um, this is when women will sometimes feel, I feel fluffy. You know, they're just not feeling hundred percent. And so I think it's really important for people to understand it can be not just somaticized, so physical symptoms, it can be emotional symptoms. A lot of women, um, you know, the anxiety and depression, they may uh, feel like their, their cravings go up. They may be craving certain types of foods. And so really leaning into what's going on with the body and understanding that uh, sometimes it can be something as subtle as eating more cruciferous vegetables, as an example, can help you package up and get rid of estrogen um, you know, and it, again, it's this relative estrogen dominance in relationship to lowered progesterone levels. And so that's, that's usually the beginning. And for many people, it's very subtle, at least initially, I, I feel like maybe in your late thirties, when they start having these symptoms, but they chalk it up to having young children at home, they've got a demanding job, just a lot of stress. Maybe that's what's, you know, precipitating some of it. And then as perimenopause goes on, it then becomes, you know, you're not ovulating necessarily every month. You may bleed every month. Um, our eggs are as old as we are. We're not like men that replenish sperm. I think every 72 hours, if memory serves me correctly. And so it's important for women to understand, like if you're 42, your eggs are 42 years old. So they are not going to be as efficient. You're not at peak fertility anymore. And so you may not be ovulating every month. Um, you, you may have cycles that start to become a little bit more irregular. Maybe they're a little lighter. They're a little heavier. It waxes and wanes and, and perimenopause is as unique as we are as individuals. I think that's important for people to understand because I use perimenopause as a litmus test for how well a woman is taking care of herself. And I don't know if you want me to kind of dive into my, mm -hmm. my you know, methodology behind that, but the better you take care of yourself in perimenopause, the less uh, traumatizing that transition will be into menopause. And so this means the sleep piece. This means you're doing the right types of exercise. Gone are the days where you're doing CrossFit or Orange Theory Fitness five days a week that is just going to elevate your cortisol. It is not going to help buffer. So all of a sudden there are specific types of exercise that I really like women to lean into managing your stress properly. And that's not just doing five minutes of meditation. That means you really genuinely have to find uh, an array of, of strategies that appeal to you and that you kind of lean into on a daily basis. It also means anti-inflammatory nutrition. It's not sexy to talk about um, inflammatory foods. A lot of these are triggering foods. They're uh, a large uh, component or constituent of the processed food industry, but things like gluten and dairy for a lot of women become hugely problematic. And I do want to talk about alcohol. Uh, you know, the, the last two years have been challenging for all of us. 
I'm seeing more and more women that have been using alcohol as a kind of like let off the steam. Their kids finally get in bed. They want to have a couple of glasses of wine. Well, it's important for people to understand that alcohol and there's no judgment. Um, alcohol is one of these these substances that for a lot of women, especially middle-aged women, it will dysregulate your melatonin. So you're not going to get your sleep hormone working properly. It'll increase cortisol. So you're going to be wired and tired. It more than likely will also contribute to some degree of blood sugar dysregulation. So you're not going to be craving healthy food. You're going to crave crap. And then on top of it, you're probably not going to have a good night's sleep. So it is not at all uncommon for women to say like, I don't know what happened to me. I only had two glasses of wine and then I had a terrible night of sleep and I felt awful the next day. So it's important for us to understand that inflammatory foods in general can be problematic along with, you know, processed sugars. And so a lot of what, what I do in that stage is really impressing upon women that choices sometimes have consequences and it, everything is a choice. So it may be that you choose to have a glass of wine, you know, your sleep's going to be terrible, but then you'll get back on track or, you know, it's a, it's a special event. You're going to have the cake. You're going to feel like crud a couple hours later you're going to, you know, get back on track the following day. So I think it's important just to be transparent and say that, you know, as one example, hot flashes, which not everyone's going to experience, but there is a direct correlation with blood sugar dysregulation and the degree of hot flashes. And so the most metabolically inflexible, the most metabolically unhealthy women are going to have the most hot flashes. And I have seen women that have gone from having terrible hot flashes to just using intermittent fasting as a strategy to feeling a thousand percent better and then figuring out what their triggers are. And so I, I think on a lot of levels, when we're talking to middle-aged patients about what is to come, a lot of it is the lifestyle medicine piece that is so critically important and so needed. And I'll be the first person to say that hormones may also be necessary during this time, but it is not the first out of the gate uh, fo focus that we should have. It really should be lifestyle stuff first, get that all dialed in. And then if you still need hormones and there's no shame in that, absolutely no shame in that. I think I, I recorded on, um, on my podcast a few days ago with, um, Avram Blumming, who wrote a book called estrogen matters, an, an amazing book. And, and that was a lot of what he was saying was that he said, people are thanking me for having the conversation because everyone's paranoid about taking hormone replacement therapy. So I think from, I'm hoping I'm ans I answered your, your question, but yes, perimenopause can be five to 10 years, depends on the individual. Mm -hmm. If people are very attuned to their bodies, they may be aware of those subtle changes about sleep and anxiety and depression type things that start in, in your late thirties. For a lot of other people, they don't hit the wall until about 45. And then all of a sudden they're like, whoa, wait a minute. All of what I used to do no longer works. And what do I need to do differently? Cause I'm not gonna live feeling like this for the rest of my life. Yeah, I think, you know, you talked about sleep, you know, it's, I have, a, I have an aura ring, which there's a, there's a newer ring different. Yeah, there's actually a new ring coming out. It's not or it's different that actually I might be getting because um, of the way it does sleep testing. But it's really interesting to use my aura and see how like, I can't have a glass of wine after six o'clock at night and go to bed at nine and not have it disrupt my deep sleep and my REM sleep, you know, and I get more restless legs. It's interesting to see how many wakings I have you know, just from a small amount. So I think people being aware of their bodies, listening to their bodies, and sometimes technology helps us interpret stuff better. I've figured out personally, fasting, for example, if I don't eat within three hours of going to bed at night, I get a lot more REM, a lot more deep sleep. If I eat right before I go to bed, the first half of my night, I have all these awakenings. Yeah. And it's really interesting. I don't realize this, but it, I pick it up on this, on technology. And so it's, I've learned over the last year and wearing my ring and tracking it that I'm, the advice I give everybody else, I have to follow as well, you know? Yep. And so I think that just sleep is such a huge, huge, huge thing. Um, but I do want to get back a little bit to some of the hormone stuff. Cause I, one thing I think was insightful with your book was this, this perimenopausal stage that is not just, you know, hormones, the nun, and it's different. It's unique. I loved what you said. It's every woman's different. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the analogy I give a lot of people is, you know, estrogen is your superpower. It allows you to have a career to be an ER nurse and a cardiology nurse and <laughs> raise kids and do all this crazy stuff. But if you're living this high cortisol life, which is almost like your kryptonite and you lose your estrogen, all of a sudden now, like you, like almost like you mentioned, all of a sudden, all these symptoms start going in. It is very much a window into people's health. Mm -hmm. You know, how, how well you're meeting stress relationships, diet, sleep, all these basic things that make all the cool stuff work better. So if you can walk through some of those, those the stages you mentioned, you know, when your estrogen's fluctuating, your LH is off, then the, estro the estradiol goes up, it fluctuates, progesterone goes low, and then how it kind of ends out. How does 
your your method, the fasting, how's it actually mitigating all these perimenopausal changes? How can fasting alone, on top of all this, really help women deal with this better? You, you alluded to it briefly, because if you take a little deep dive, I'd really, really appreciate that. Yeah, no, I, I think that you know, along with sleep being a litmus test of how well we're taking care of ourselves, our menstrual cycle, it's really important to understand. And this is going to be an oversimplification, but there are times in our menstrual cycle where we should fast and there are times when we should not. And it's important, you know, you mentioned estradiol. So estrogen predominates from, you know, when we start bleeding until right before ovulation. And it's important to understand like estrogen is um, an incredible hormone. It does a lot of different things, but one thing it allows us to, is we can work out harder we can fast longer, um, more insulin, we're more insulin sensitive in the beginning of our menstrual cycle. And this is, if you're looking at a 28 to 30 day cycle, let me just preemptively say that. Um, and then, you know, we get, we come to a point where testosterone and estrogen peak, and then the luteal phase, which is the second half of the menstrual cycle is when progesterone predominates. And this is when we become a little more insulin resistant. I'm not saying that all of a sudden this shows up that you're, you're someone's telling you have diabetes, it's just the recognition that progesterone's job is not to make you more insulin sensitive. It makes you a little more insulin resistant because your body is trying to determine whether or not um, you have fertilized an egg and whether or not you're going to then be moving on to supporting a pregnancy or you're going to be having a menstrual cycle. And so I, I remind women that when it comes to the luteal phase, you know, that first week of the luteal phase post ovulation, probably have to experiment to see how you feel five to seven days preceding your menstrual cycle, you back off of fasting. And this is because your body is actually requiring a little bit more carbohydrate. Although it was interesting, I did a webinar last night and the statistic I brought up was 260% more refined carbs are, are consumed in the late luteal phase or so right before menstruation. This is an average, but all a woman needs to do is consume maybe a half a cup of sweet potato or a little more root vegetables right before their menstrual cycle. And that will satisfy your body's needs for a little bit more carbohydrate, a little bit more calories. And so that is the time in a woman's menstrual cycle. I say no fasting, 12, 13 hours of digestive rest is perfect. I'm not suggesting you don't, you know, that you go back to eating mini meals and snacks. That's not what I'm advocating for, but really leaning into perimenopause and acknowledging, or even if you're still cycling regularly and you're a bit younger, the acknowledgement that eating and exercising and fasting based on where you are in your cycle is going to allow you to balance some of these hormones that uh, Dr. Hartman just alluded to. It's going to better balance cortisol, insulin. Um, again, this is an oversimplification. There's a lot of other factors that play into this. It's all about leaning into where you are with physical activity and nutrition, and also being mindful of you know, your sleep quality, your stress management. If you're doing those things properly, you are going to, you're going to successfully be able to fast during your menstrual cycle. Now I'm going to get the question of what are, what are women doing if they have very irregular cycles? You know, what are the things you can do? Well, sometimes I will recommend, and I know this is, you know, there's, there's conflicting research on whether or not this is helpful, but for a lot of women, they do fast based on their lunar calendar. So they look at a full moon as the day of menstruation. And then from there, they will do, they will follow the same pattern. Um, certainly as women start going, getting closer and closer to the latter stages of perimenopause, some women may, may continue bleeding every month. Some women may skip a cycle every couple of months. Some women will have a cycle every single month and then it will just stop abruptly. So I think the bio-individuality piece is really important for people to understand. Obviously, if your mother had a very typical, like maybe your mom menstruated every single month and then it just abruptly stopped, you probably will follow like your parent. Now, with that being said, there are many of us that we have completely the opposite of that. So recognizing that the choices we are making day to day, whether it's the frequency with which we eat, the quality of sleep that we actually embrace, the type of nutrition that we choose to consume, the type of exercise that we do, our stress management, those factors um, can really mitigate and buffer how successful we can be with fasting. One thing I do want to mention is that the first few months a woman is fasting, if she's still getting a menstrual cycle, you may see some changes. Your cycle may be lighter, it may be heavier. One or two cycles like that, I have no issues with. If your period goes away and you're not pregnant, that may be a sign that it's too much stress. Remember we talked about hormetic stress, beneficial stress, stress in the right amount that makes us stronger. Sometimes our bodies are very, very attuned. And, and so the hypothalamus pituitary axis is communicating with the ovaries and if it perceives that you're not consuming enough food, 
during your feeding window, it may say time out, um, there's a famine. And because there's a famine, we're shutting down all this reproductive capabilities right now. So I really do take missed menstrual cycles, uh, cessation of menses. I take that very, very seriously. I'm sure it's probably conversations that you have with your patients as well. But I, I always think it's important to tie that in because I, I feel like there's so much misinformation on the internet that it's important to at least let people know, like that's another, like your menstrual cycle should be another, it should really be another vital sign in my estimation. Yeah. No, I can really love what you said about the lunar cycles. It was really funny when I was at the Medical College of Virginia doing labor and delivery, we had way more deliveries during full moons and no one could mm -hmm. ever explain it, but you kind of take a deep dive in some of the um, bioenergetic medicine. There actually is, a, there is some communication with mm -hmm. these things in our bodies. And just because we can't put our finger hundred percent on, doesn't mean it's not valid. It just means we can't hundred yep. percent explain it. Just like I can't hundred percent explain how acupuncture works. Yep. You know, I think I do understand it, but I can't understand how massage makes your cortisol go down, but I know it does, you know? Um, so I think just recognizing that there's more to medicine than, than just um, articles. There's actually experience and, and using other healing traditions and the wisdom that's kind of built into them is really, really huge. Um, you actually already answered, I was gonna quote you a different quote. So <laughs> and you, and you already went through it. So I'm gonna go to the next one. I'm gonna shift a little bit. Um, as you know, I'm really big into fat. I'm really, fat is super huge. Um, I see so many patients with low cholesterol. People don't realize that if your cholesterol is too low, you actually have an increased risk for certain cancers like breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, colon cancer. Um, you know, a quote from your book here, 75% of cholesterol in the body comes from what we does, um, comes from the liver, not what we eat. About 25% is supplied by the diet from things we eat from animal protein, et cetera. Can you talk about, you know, this, our misunderstanding of cholesterol, about where it comes from and how fasting specifically helps modulate that? Well, I think, you know, and I, I laugh because this really starts back with Ansel Keys in the 1950s where, you know, the seven country study and how um, fat became vilified as opposed to sugar. And so from there, from there, we started, we as a society really started to navigate away from eating a more nutrient dense whole foods diet. And this is when margarine and vegetable oils and all these other kind of fake fats cropped up and all of a sudden steak and butter and eggs were vilified. And so I think as we've gotten farther away from that, although I'm grateful we're now kind of swinging back the opposite direction, um, the whole concept of understanding that fat lights up our taste buds, it makes food more appealing. Um, it is intricately involved in hormonal regulation. It is critically important for cushioning joints and muscles and involved in so many processes that we don't give it enough credit. And, and you, as you can well imagine in cardiology, we did a lot of lipid management and I used to routinely reduce patient statins because their total cholesterol was way too low. And I would get yelled at, which became a running joke, but yes, um, a, a, a low total cholesterol can be a poor prognostic, um, uh, indicator and a marker of morbidity and mortality. And so that was always the impetus that I came from, but I think it's important for people to not be um, fixated on, um, you know, lipid profiles as one example, I, I want to make sure that I mention I'm for more, I'm far more interested in triglyceride levels. I'm far more interested in HDL, which is considered to be the heart healthy cholesterol, less concerned about LDL, unless we're getting really nuanced and granular and looking at advanced lipid analysis and particle size and things like that. But I, I think that on a lot of levels, when we're eating a more nutrient dense diet, when we're consuming animal-based protein and healthy fats, we are better able to modulate blood sugar. We're better able to modulate insulin. Um, along with that, we also have, you know, this eating less frequently model uh, of which I'm a huge proponent of. And this can also be very helpful. You know, when people were looking as an example at triglycerides, and I used to tell my patients, you know, if your triglycerides are up, you know, what are you eating? What are the processed carbohydrates that you're eating? A lot of sugar, high fructose corn syrup is one example. I think that's one of those hidden, non-talked about. But when we talk about like what forms triglycerides, what are they made in response to? How do we store sugar in the body and glycogen, et cetera? It's important for people to understand that our food choices and our food frequency have a lot to do with this. And I, I think on a lot of levels that when we're talking about fasting as a modulator of improving lipid profiles and, and you know, kind of tapping into fat stores for energy, um, and I would imagine that's probably what you're wanting me to allude to, is that when we're in a less frequently eating state, if we're in a less fed state, our body intrinsically can kind of tap into these fat stores for energy 
um, free them up and, and these ketones can be used as a form of energy. And so I think it's important for people to understand that this degree of energy efficiency, um, even allowing, for example, certain types of um, fatty acids and ketones to be diffused across the blood brain barrier um, allows for tremendous mental clarity. So I remind people that we don't want to be not consuming healthy fats. We want to make sure that we're finding the right balance for our bodies. I'm sure for you, you see a lot of people that are fat malabsorbed and that's a whole separate conversation, but I see a lot of women with gut health issues and dysbiosis and other things that really have to be conscientious about portions of healthy fats. And if they're mindful of that, it's about finding a balance, what works for you, how well you digest your fats, making good food choices and eating less frequently can allow you to, you know, bring your overall um, lab values into better alignment. Well, I really, I really, Cynthia, I really love what you said about, you mentioned triglycerides, which actually don't get a whole lot of respect. And it's interesting <laughs> how fasting, you know, um, when you fast, you improve paroxysmal function, which is this little organelle in your cells that actually um, help control fat and actually particularly triglycerides and their malfunction is actually marked by elevated triglycerides. And one of the best things to get that down is actually fasting. Mm -hmm. And it's simple how many of these things we chase with, we chase with medications, we say, Hey, cut back the carbs, but it's not going down. And just that, that eating sunrise or sunset, even if you're not eating a lot, but that, that feeding cycle by itself can cause dysfunction in these parts of our cell that drive these metabolic things. And, and again, fasting is a um, huge player in that one thing, actually, one thing I was, I wanted you to talk about briefly was cholesterol and hormones. You know, a lot of people don't realize how cholesterol actually turns into all your sex hormones. Mm -hmm. I routinely see, I routinely see males who are on statins, who have a cholesterol of like 140, 150, and their testosterone's low. And now the urologist is giving them testosterone injections. And it's like, maybe your cholesterol being too low is inducing that. Could you talk about that briefly in, the, in regards to um, hormonal health? Yeah. And it's important for people to understand, like we don't want our cholesterol to be too low because we cleave off sex hormones from cholesterol. And it's, it's critically important. And much to your point, uh, a lot of times we're not thinking upstream and so if your testosterone is low, it could be stress mediated, it could be your cholesterol. So there's so many downstream net impact that it should never be that we're the knee jerk reaction is to step in and, and want to, I'm not saying the hormone might not be needed, but that's not the first step. So making sure you're getting enough high quality um, animal based protein and healthy fats, uh, making sure you're consuming enough that when you look at your your lab values. And I know there's like a conventional ideal range and then there's a functional range. And, and oftentimes there's not a lot of overlap and there's no gender preferences of any kind. I think it's important for people to understand that there are genetic susceptibilities. I'm actually someone that's called a lean hyper responder. Um, there's a, an amazing engineer who's kind of really changing the way that clinicians are looking at cholesterol values and LDL and particle size, et cetera. And so sometimes when people are making dietary changes, as an example, their cholesterol, total cholesterol will go up, their LDL will go up, but it's not actually a reflection of something negative. Their body is kind of getting into a position where they're, um, you know, they're upregulating some processes that allow their bodies to, to utilize these, you know, chylomicrons and other things more effectively. But getting back to your original question, we want our cholesterol to be at a healthy amount, because if not, we cannot go on to make testosterone, progesterone, estradiol, we will not make enough of these hormones. And we're already in a metabolically inflexible state as a society. And a lot of the things we're exposed to our environment, personal care products, our food, et cetera, are already driving down testosterone, already driving down estrogen. A lot of men that I look at, um, you know, when, when they look very feminized as an example, they're aromatizing their testosterone to estrogen. So they're going from having probably a fairly decent testosterone level, but between the degree of insulin resistance they're experiencing and exposure from, again, the personal care products, the food and the environment, they're driving down otherwise healthy hormone levels. And so I think it really stems from multiple factors. Um, I know a lot of the, the topics that you talk about um, in your community are very aligned with this, but I think people are oftentimes surprised. It's so many things that will impact cholesterol and then indirectly sex hormones. But another key piece, and let's be honest, last two years have been super stressful. Stress has a major, major impact. Um, remember I said that sympathetic 
drive in our bodies. We're being chased by a rabid, you know, dog or running away from a saber toothed tiger. We're not stopping to have sex. Our bodies are kind of overriding our desire to stop and have sex because we're fleeing from danger. That's the body's perception. It doesn't differentiate that between just being stressed from your job, your circumstances, et cetera. Yeah, those, those are all amazing points. Um, I'm going to shift um, our focus just a little bit and talk about sugar just a little bit. I feel like people usually talk about sugar on the front end. Um, but let's talk about it briefly, you know, sugar swings, insulin, sugar swings, stress, sleep apnea, sleep disturbance, all these things play into these sugar swings, which is ultimately looking at it's reflecting insulin sensitivity. 80% of Americans um, have a certain degree of insulin resistance, you know, 15% mm -hmm. of Americans are diabetic, 35% are pre-diabetic. So when we talk about this, we are not talking about a small number of things. And so, you know, let's talk about sugar swings and hormones and fasting, you know, mm -hmm. what are they, how, what do you consider a sugar swing? I think our numbers, you know, Cynthia are probably different than the numbers people are used to talking about. Um, what's, what's a good sugar? Um, how bad are they? And how do these sugar swings affect hormones and vice versa as well? Yeah. Well, it, so it's not normal to, to have these sugar swings or episodes of hypoglycemia or swinging high. It means that the receptors on the cell are, are getting dysregulated. It's almost like someone's knocking on your front door, but no one can hear uh, the knock. And so I, I think this really stems from this kind of methodology that we're supposed to be eating to stoke our metabolism. We have to eat every two to three hours. Um, we have to eat a highly processed uh, grain focused diet, you know, heart healthy grains makes me cringe. And so I would argue that moving away from a nutrient dense model where we eat, uh, you know, two or three times a day without snacks in between, and we don't drink our, our calories, you know, from sugary beverages has created the perfect storm for metabolic inflexibility. So it is not normal to um, have a, a fasting blood sugar uh, over a hundred. And in fact, I would argue that I like to see a fasting blood sugar in the 80 to 90 range. That's where I like to see it. I like to see fasting insulin between two to five. I mean, I get, I've gotten and uric acid levels under five. So really the more I've learned and I'm so I'm old enough that when I was graduating from my nurse practitioner program, we would identify a high blood sugar as 140. <laughs> so, um, you know, now it, it's continued to creep down, thank goodness. But understanding that our meal frequency, our food choices, when we move away from nutrient density, animal-based protein, healthy fats, non-starchy vegetables, and we start focusing on eating more frequently, eating um, carbohydrate-laden foods, um, drinking our calories is not going to sensitize those blood, the, the, the cells to be able to uptake um, the, uh, the effect of insulin's uh, messaging and blood sugar. So I, I think that, you know, we could talk about um, what happens when people are primarily sugar burners or carbohydrate burners. They are frequently hungry. They get hangry. They, they have weight loss resistance. They have energy slumps. It is not normal. If you struggle to get two hours after a meal, it's the wrong uh, macronutrient profile. I think that's really important to talk about. Whereas when people can effectively and efficiently utilize, go back and forth between carbohydrates and fats for energy, that's what we want. We be flexible to be able to go back and forth. We have sustained energy. We can lose weight. We don't have energy slumps. Um, we aren't falling asleep after a meal. That's also not normal. I tell people all the time, if you feel like you need to fall asleep immediately after a meal, it's definitely a sign that you put your, your macros, protein, fat, and carbohydrates not together in a beneficial way. So really understanding that eating less often will teach your body to be able to be flexible with using different types of fuel sources to properly fuel the body. I always remind people that fasting is not new or novel, that it's been around since biblical times. And, and it, it was around before refrigeration when, when there really was food scarcity. And so if this was not aligned with the way our bodies are designed to properly uh, be homeostatic, it would not have been around for all this time. So I, I remind people that the, the sugar burners, the people that are you know dealing with energy slumps, um, that are told they're insulin resistant, they're told they're metabolically inflexible, they're struggling with energy, their sleep is terrible, it, it's fixable. Like that is the big message is completely mm -hmm. fixable, but you have to do the work. There's no magic pill. There is definitely not, you know, we can't wave our wand as much as I would love to be able to do that. And, and I'm sure you as well, but you have to put in the work to change the lifestyle piece so that you can successfully fast and to do it in a way that 
is sustainable. But I think blood sugar dysregulation is something I'm fascinated by, but I'll be the first person to say, if someone tells me they're reactive hypoglycemic, I'm like, that's not good. No. Don't tell me, you know, your blood sugar is too high because that tells me work you have to do. And there's oftentimes it's beyond just eating less frequently. It's stress management, sleep quality, the right types of exercise, anti-inflammatory nutrition. Um, and especially for women, we know as we get closer to menopause, we become increasingly more insulin resistant because it, because um, estrogen is, a, is buffering and it's an insulin sensitive hormone. And so I'll see women that will say, I don't understand. I'm 120 pounds. How could I be insulin resistant or prone to it? And a lot of it is this loss of estradiol. And, and for women, it's not as if it's gradual. It's almost like you get shoved off a cliff. I mean, it really is that dramatic. Some people are more um, sensitive to this change than others, but a lot of it can be mitigated if you're watching and trending blood work in your 40s, late 30s, up into early 50s. And women will say, I don't understand why this is happening, but blood sugar dysregulation is not normal. We should not tolerate it. We should not believe that hypoglycemia should be normal. I have all sorts of tricks to how to work around that, but I think it's important for people to recognize it's not a normal thing. I think, you know, knowing history is really interesting. Knowing the ancient Spartans ate one meal a day, mm -hmm. American Midwest, we ate a meal and a half a day. It wasn't until the 1950s that the whole three square meals a day, and then the seventies, we started getting like snack foods. So it's only in recent times that we have these feeding cycles from sunrise to sunset, which absolutely destroy our ability to switch from a sugar metabolism to a fat metabolism. So what people are doing is they're getting stuck. They're almost like the runners when people get the run, they hit the wall. It's when their metabolism is switching from a sugar glycogen to a fat metabolism. Mm -hmm. And it, and some people, have, they get stuck there for a bit. And that's what people are experiencing on a daily basis. And so, you know, just getting out the word that actually the norm, the normal, the abnormal thing is what we're doing today. The normal thing actually is to have a little fasting in your life, spreading out meals. Um, I feel like we could talk for hours about your book, about all this kind of stuff. Um, I really, a couple of things I want to mention about the book I really thought were really cool is how you actually dove into like the different times of woman's life and different cycles and how the food varieties could affect mm -hmm. um, the hormones, which is something I had not actually heard before about how you can actually specify the foods. Mm -hmm. And then even the exercise, like changing exercise during the cycle, like you said before, you know, when the estrogen is really high, you can, you can handle more stress versus when it's low. You know, I think there's, there's a lot of really cool nuggets, a lot of great information in, in your books. So I encourage people to take a look at it. Um, any parting wor words, you know, how can we, you know, if we want to know more about you, where can we find more about you? What, do, what are you doing and what, what's next for you? Why don't you kind of close out with that? Oh, thank you. Um, well, the book intermittent fasting transformation, I have 45 will be officially published on March 15th. So I'm really excited to bring that to birth that into the world feels like my third child. Um, I have a great podcast for which you will be joining me, um, shortly everyday wellness. It's a great way to, you know, connect with me and other, um, you know, experts in the field. I feel very grateful. It's probably one of my favorite things I do in my business. Um, easiest way to connect is www.cynthiathurlow.com. That's my website. You can connect uh, to the podcast. You can see me being snarky on Twitter, um, Instagram. I'm, I probably have my biggest presence there. I've got a free Facebook group called intermittent fasting backslash my name, where you're more than welcome to join. And it's a very supportive community, but I, I feel very, very humbled and, and really excited that uh, the book is finally here. It feels like it's been a long journey. Yeah, I think it's a really approachable book about talking about fasting. And it's something I'm using all the time in my clinic when I talk to people about SIBO and dysbiosis and gut health and a whole host of things that um, I think it's we're realizing how it's not, it's not just what you eat, it's when and how you don't eat that can actually have a massive health impact. So so uh, Cynthia, thank you for your time today. I know you're busy. Um, you know, it's been great talking with you and hopefully your book and your message will change people's lives. Um, I've already sent people your way um, and they've been really impressed by the quality of work you're doing. And I'm really happy that you're in my ecosystem of people to turn to. So thanks a lot for being with us today. Thank you. And likewise.